My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC ECHO. Welcome to this week's session, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. This is a question that I've been thinking about presenting to you for a while, and it's a question to you. I'm going to ask you, does this patient need PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis? So I was at my clinic, and I got a call from just someone to Gay City, and he said he was a 20-year-old Asian man who was on tenofovir only for hep B treatment. And he was calling because the night before he'd had receptive sex with an HIV positive guy and the condom broke. Uh, and he reported that he was taking his tenofovir every day. And he and his hepatitis provider had previously talked about using uh, FTC TDF as PrEP, but they had decided against it because he reported 100% condom use. So the question to me was, you know, what, is he, what does he do? It's sort of eight o'clock at night. And the question was, should he go to the emergency department for PEP? Okay, great, 100% say yes. Now, my follow-up question to you is, if he had been on FTC TDF and reporting 100%, would you refer him for PEP? So the reason why I'm bringing this up now is for those of you who went to ID Week, that there was another case of PrEP failure reported. And he's 21, this just came out of San Francisco. He's 21, he was HIV negative when he started by pooled antibody, sorry, point of care antibody test and pooled NAT, and then got retested at month three, six, and 10 was negative. And on his 13 month visit, he tested negative again by their point of care test, but he had a individual RNA that ended up being read as 559 copies and supposedly had great adherence by both dried blood spot and hair. And he had on his genotype a M184V conferring resistance, of course, to his FTC and his regimen, as well as those other mutations you see, but did not have a mutation to tenofovir and by phenotyping had susceptibility to tenofovir. And his named partner who had detectable virus uh, had the same exact mutations he had. So this is another prep failure. We're going to see more PrEP failures, but I thought one of the interesting things about this case was about the fact that he was on tenofovir and it should have been active and why didn't tenofovir provide protection? The guidance around tenofovir monotherapy and PEP to give you answers to your question, this is from the US uh, Public Health Service, uh, the 2017 guidance that came out earlier this year, so that tenofovir alone has shown substantial efficacy and safety in trials with people who inject drugs and heterosexually active adults and can be considered as alternative for these populations, but not for men of sex with men among its efficacy has not been studied. And that patients fully adhering to that daily PrEP regimen, again, this is of FTC TDF, do not need NPEP if they experience a potential HIV exposures while on PrEP. Of course, you sort of have the question of how do you know they've been really fully adhering or not? That's another question we could talk about. But for patients who report taking their PrEP medication sporadically and those who didn't take it within the week before the exposure, initiating that 28-day course of NPEP may be indicated. There is no guidance in the U.S. Public Health Service for when to refer for PEP in people on tenofovir alone, which is considered to be a reasonable alternative for people who are not MSM. There is guidance about not referring for NPEP if you have been adherent on PrEP. The, just because, you know, the IAS USA gave us that little sort of twist about um, event-based PrEP, I wanted to pull up what they said about tenofovir monotherapy, and of course they conflict with the previous guidelines. So their 2018 release say that both the combination of TDF3DC, TAF, FTC, which we know is Descovy, or TDF alone are not recommended for anyone at this time. And they had no comment on PEP following PrEP. So I just wanted to review what the data show about uh, efficacy of tenofovir monotherapy for use as PrEP. And I'm going to highlight the three studies that are on the slide that I often use as sort of the basis for FDA approval and guidance. The first is VOICE, which of course showed no efficacy of any of the modalities used for PrEP and felt to be due to low adherence. So I'm not going to talk any more about that. The second is the Bangkok TDF study which used uh, TDF alone in injection drug users and the, in the modified intent to treat analysis. So removing the individuals who had acute HIV at starting, the efficacy was 49%. 
But because, as we know, the, these efficacy estimates depend so much on adherence estimates, and that differs so much in the populations, I don't think it's really fair to say, well, our tenofovir monotherapy estimate is lower than all of our TDF-FTC estimates, and therefore it has lower efficacy. So we're going to look a little more de in depth at the only study which compared the two head-to-head, -head, and that was the Partners Prep study. And these are all slides that I borrowed from Jared. So just very quickly, Partners Prep was a phase three randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled three-arm trial, which I'll show you in a second, of tenofovir monotherapy versus combination prep versus placebo for prevention of HIV by seronegative partners in heterosexual discordant couples. And they enrolled almost 5,000 couples. So the initial strategy was this one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one randomized study between tenofovir alone, the FTC tenofovir arm, and placebo, and a DSMB evaluation recommend early discontinuing of the placebo arm. So that arm was stopped, and those individuals were then randomized to it continued to be blinded to either TDF alone or FTC. So what I'm going to show you first is that efficacy estimate in those two groups. So in compared to placebo, in the before the uh, 2011 stop, there were uh, 13 infections in the combination prep arm, 17 in the tenofovir monotherapy arm, compared to 52 in the placebo arm, which came to a efficacy estimate in the modified intent to treat analysis of 75% for FTC and 67 for TDF. That was what was originally reported. They were not felt to be statistically significantly different than each other. But then as I mentioned, what happened is that those placebo participants then got re-randomized and the study continued to accrue patient to accrue patient time for another year and a half or so. So in total, there were 4,000 plus subjects who were assigned to some sort of active prep medicines. Most of the people who were in placebo were randomized to one of the active arms, and a total of 8,800 8, person years total were accrued, including 3,500 that happened after the placebo arm was stopped in July of 2011. What you can see is, and is the total number of infections in the TDF arm was 31. The total number of infections in the combination arm was 21, which comes to a incidence per 100 person years in both arms of less than 1. 0.7 in the TDF monotherapy, 0.48 in the combination one. I'll draw your eyes to the bottom where it said while the placebo arm was going, the incidence was 2 per 100 person years. So again, showing efficacy of both of them. And then this 0.67 estimate is the comparison of FTC to TDF, and though lower in the TDF arm, more protection in the combination arm, lower rate of infections in the combination arm, it was not statistically different. When they did the subset analysis looking only at the individuals who had detectable drug levels, the estimates are in the ballpark of what we typically sort of say for efficacy when you take your medicines every day. So 85% relative risk reduction if you had detectable drug levels compared to those in the active arm who did not have detectable drug levels and 90% for the combination. So both highly effective. There has been, so moving away from partners prep, there has been some uh, literature devoted to efficacy of tenofovir monotherapy um, as HIV prep among individuals who are receiving tenofovir alone for hep B treatment. The first was a report of two men of sex with men who had undetectable HBV DNA for three, over three years. This was used as a surrogate for adherence over time. At the time of HIV diagnosis, they reported that they had been taking their tenofovir and they had high tenofovir drug levels at the time of HIV diagnosis. Both of them had acute HIV symptoms. One, interestingly, despite having acute HIV symptoms, had a HIV virus level of under 50 copies, and the other had 159,000 copies, both having wild-type virus. The second report is a single man of sex with men who started off with a very high HBV viral load that became detect undetectable by one year. He had multiple HIV tests during this time, and that about two years into HBV treatment, 
he had an HIV RNA level that had 59 copies, good for them for detecting it, and a K65R mutation. And then they looked back and retrospectively, he had super low HIV RNA levels for three months. So just some reports, um, just like we're seeing case reports of individuals who fail FTC, TDF as PrEP, there have been failures reported. But my conclusion to this is that tenofovir alone can be considered, although you know the reasons for just using TDF in, and not TDF, FTC are not completely clear to me of the indications for that. But if there is some reason, you can consider using TDF alone as HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis for people who inject drugs in heterosexual adults that PEP should be considered in exposed men, and probably anyone who had been on TDF alone if there is an HIV exposure. And then, you know, the what happens as with our case is that the discussion then should be whether or not the patient should actually be on FTC TDF for their hep B treatment and for HIV PrEP. And then just sort of the shout out that PrEP failures do occur, will occur, they're not surprising. In patients who are highly adherent, it is not 100%. And it is sort of the same same message, whether people are on tenofovir or FTC tenofovir.